Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first presentation of Avalanche Canada's webinar series. First of all, we would like to thank our sponsors. We are very thankful for our sponsors for being steadfast in their financial support for us during these challenging economic climate and working with us to reach new backcountry users this winter. We look forward to working with them in the future. So we got a few housekeeping rules, uh, tips, I guess, more than anything. As attendees, you folks are all muted automatically when you come on. Um, with that being said, it just keeps all the chatter down. It looks like we got 304 attendees today, which is fantastic for our first webinar. Um, there's gonna be an opportunity throughout the session for some Q&A, to ask questions and get some comments in there. So if you hit the little raise hand feature, you can see it on your little dialogue box there. Um, that will get you in the queue and you can ask an audio question. And if you're not quite into just talking out loud, then we can you can put it into the questions chat box. And that's also in the GoTo dashboard there. So with that being said, today's presentation is uh, Avalanche Canada's One Stop Avalanche Shop and the Mountain Information Network. Our presentation this evening is going to take a look at the many tools and resources that Avalanche Canada has at uh, avalanche.ca and see what we can provide you to be safe in the mountains. We will also focus on the Mountain Information Network, the MIN, as this will have a greater importance this year. You too can play an active part in sharing data with our forecasters. Our presenter this evening is Grant Helgeson. Grant is a senior forecaster and project manager at Avalanche Canada who makes good decisions 99% of the time. If he's not at work or playing in the hills, he's probably lusting over some carbon skis or bikes or fly rods. So I'm gonna pass along to Grant now, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Just a second there, Grant. Looks like we got some technical difficulties. Looks like uh, folks can't hear you currently. One moment. How's that? Are we getting that now? Perfect. Looks like we are. We For some reason, my mic decided to not work at the at the just the wrong time there. Gotta like um, that technology. No problem. This is just part of the fun of webinars. You know, this is one of my favorite things to do as an avalanche forecaster, to get out there, provide the outreach, talk to you guys, interact with the people, all the sledders and skiers and ice climbers that we have scattered throughout Western Canada. And usually that means driving one of the fancy new Avalanche Canada trucks around, riding a bike, having beers with you guys afterwards at the pub and answering questions and just generally getting stoked on winter. But it's a little bit different format this year. So we're psyched that we can still do this work. We're psyched that we can still recreate in the backcountry. We're pretty fortunate as Canadians. And uh, it's going to be a great season. It's going to be a little bit different season, but it's going to be a great one. So as we start to look at this mosaic of folks that we have out there, I'm curious to hear who's out there. It's one of my favorite questions. And what I want to ask first is, how much avalanche education have y'all got out there? Are, are we looking mostly at people who are new to the backcountry? Are we looking at folks who have taken an AST or Avalanche Skills Training 1 or AST 2? Are there any snow nerds in the audience who have taken the professional level uh, courses? So go ahead and jump in there. Click on that poll. You know, we know that it's a wild thing, but just like bikes flew off the shelves this summer, we know that there's record sales and backcountry equipment right now. I'm hearing from friends who work in the industry that sales are through the roof at the moment. It's going to be a busy season in the backcountry. So Tell me a little bit about who's out there using that poll. Oh, cool. Okay, so we've kind of got a little, uh, quite a few people of AST1s, and then about half the group has not taken any education or just attended one of our Avalanche seminars or workshop. And there's a few, uh, few AST2s, which I think to date is still one of my most valuable Avalanche courses that really helped me make, kind of formulate how to make decisions in the back entry. And there's a few professionals out there too. That's very cool. So my next question is, 
how do you recreate in the backcountry? Uh, myself, I grew up as a ski racer and my parents had me on skis as just a little guy. Grew up ski racing, got started sledding about 15 years ago. And now I'm on any given day, I'm both a sledder and a skier. I lived in central Alberta and climbed ice for a few years too, which got me to some of the most beautiful places that I've ever visited, but also some of the scariest places I've ever been in my life. Ice climbing can be terrifying for the uninitiated. So what are you doing out there? Are you snowmobiling, skiing, slipboarding, snowshoeing, ice climbing? I'm curious. Okay, so a lot of skiers, about 65% ski and slipboarders, 25% snowshoers, which is reflects the trend that we're seeing. There are so many more snowshoers in the backcountry these days, which is really cool. It's a really neat way to start getting into the backcountry and a few sledders and a few ice climbers. So that's great. And you know, that's kind of the deal with backcountry recreation in Western Canada too. We all travel differently, but we're out there to have this, we have the same goal. We wanna get out there and have fun. Whether you're booting up couloirs in the middle of the season or getting out there into the big gnarly alpine, I gotta plug this. This is one of my favorite days at work. This is in the uh, Brandywine backcountry. And I, this is just kind of epitomizes what mountain snowmobiling is, is to me. Um, you're out there, you know, at a hut trip, getting some good ski touring in, or just getting out there right off the road, snowshoeing or getting into these places. We all want to get out there into the backcountry of Western Canada, shake off the Valley Bottom Blues, and then make it home safely. That really is the name of the game. And that's what we do here at Avalanche Canada. We provide you with the tools to get out there, have a good time, make good choices, and then make it home in one piece, safely, tell your story. So what are the Avalanche Canada products? Well, we have a whole fleet of products from Avalanche Forecast to the Mountain Weather Forecast. We're gonna go through some of the educational resources that we provide at Avalanche Canada. And then we're gonna start stepping into things like forecaster blogs, um, which are, are always well received and we love writing them. The trip planner, which can help you match the, the current conditions with the, um, with the right places to go and recreate. The Mountain Information Network, which we're gonna kind of touch on in more detail in the second presentation, and in the mobile app too. So Avalanche Forecast, these are our flagship product, obviously. And when you navigate to avalanche.ca, you can move your mouse around, you can click on the region where you plan on recreating, and it's all right there. You can zoom, zoom in, zoom out, see the towns. You can kind of see where you want to go and play today. Um, the first thing that's going to come up when you select one of these is you're going to see the headline. And that headline is kind of just the, the first thing we want you to know. It's the distillation of a whole day's work. In this case, a week of heavy snowfall has left the snowpack prime for large human triggered avalanches. That just grabs your attention immediately. And that's what we want it to do. We want it to be a summary of what's going on in the backcountry. And as you dig a little deeper, you're gonna to start to get into things like danger ratings. Now folks rely on us heavily for danger ratings and they're a great kind of stoplight of um, how to check out avalanche conditions and decide if, if it's a good time for you to go out based on your personal risk, your hazard exposure, what you're willing to do out there. Um, and then we have the avalanche problems. And these are kind of the, the who, what, when, where of the avalanche forecast. These are really interesting little pieces that kind of tell us where does the problem exist? How likely are you to trigger it? And if you do, how big is it gonna go? So the, really kind of the meat of our forecast lives here in avalanche problems. And then we have the train and travel advice. This is the train and travel advice is kind of this friendly neighborly advice about how you can take the current conditions and go out there and make good choices. So on this day when we thought we'd have the, the snowpack prime for large human triggered avalanches, we're saying use conservative route selection. Choose moderate angled slope and support a terrain with low consequence. Seems like pretty good advice on a day like that. So that's how you kind of formulate what your what your travel plans are going to be for the day. You know, we also have a great mountain weather forecast. But before I get into that, I actually want to bring up an old friend, television's Joe Lammers and longtime forecaster at Avalanche Canada to talk to us a little bit more about getting the most out of the backcountry forecast. So we're going to hand it over to Joe here for a second. And Without further ado, he's going to take it away for us. Today, we're going to talk about how to get the most from the avalanche forecasts at avalanche.ca. The mountains of Western Canada are subdivided into several forecast regions, each of which has a mountain icon that's divided into three parts, alpine, treeline, and below treeline. The three colors tell you the danger rating assigned to each of those elevation zones. But that's just a high level overview. There's much more information deeper in the forecast to help you stay safe. 
clicking on the map icon will bring up the forecast and a whole lot more information. For a larger view, let's select the full screen option. The headline provides a one or two sentence overview of the avalanche scenario or other important information that's relevant to the bulletin. Further down the page, you'll find the danger rating section of the forecast. Based on the snowpack conditions and expected weather, forecasters rate the danger for today and the following two days. The confidence rating offers insight into factors where there's uncertainty about elements that might affect the accuracy of the forecast. In Canada, we use the North American Avalanche Danger Scale. These danger ratings reflect the likelihood of triggering an avalanche, the distribution of the avalanches, and their expected size. Forecasters rate the avalanche danger for three elevation bounds. Up in the Alpine, there are no trees, more snow falls, winds are stronger, and the sun's rays are most intense. Treeline is a transition zone. Trees are small and sparse here, but snow, wind, and sun are still major players. Below treeline is where dense, mature timber on the lower mountain and valley bottom anchors the snow. Less precipitation and shelter from the wind make avalanches here typically less likely. Now you have an idea of the situation, but the forecast offers a lot more. Think of the public avalanche forecaster as your backcountry coach. As your coach, the forecasters feel you need more than just the danger ratings to have a safe day in the mountains. If you were a fighter and you wanted some beta on your opponent, you'd probably want to know more than just whether your opponent was moderately or considerably dangerous. Wouldn't it be useful to know if you're about to step into the ring with a karate expert, or a professional wrestler, or a bear? Your approach to dealing with each of these opponents would be different in the same way that a fighter's opponents can be different from one another, so can avalanches. The fighter you're facing in the mountains is what we call the avalanche problem. The avalanche problem includes the avalanche type, its location, the likelihood of triggering, and expected size. Continuing with the fight metaphor, the avalanche type represents the kind of opponent you're facing. Elevation and aspect show where your opponent is likely waiting for you. The chance of avalanche meter shows how reactive your opponent is, and the expected size is, well, it's expected size. And here's where you'll find additional information about the avalanche problem. Terrain and travel advice are your avalanche coach's recommendations for how to reduce the risk presented by the avalanche problem. Advanced users can dig deeper into the forecast details section. On this page, you'll find three categories of information. The avalanche summary gives an overview of recent avalanche activity and might also discuss what forecasters think will happen next. In the snowpack summary, forecasters typically describe the general snowpack structure. This is where you'll find details about snowpack layering, bonding, and stability test results. The weather forecast section takes a closer look at the critical factors driving the avalanche forecast, like temperatures, ridgetop winds, precipitation, and sky cover. If you want more, our friends at Environment Canada provide the best alpine weather forecast in the country. Find it by clicking on the Weather Forecast tab. All of this will make more sense after taking an AST1 or AST2 course. Continued Avalanche Education gives you the tools to interpret the bulletins and make better decisions in the backcountry. Click on the Learn tab at avalanche.ca to get the goods on training. Now that you know how to navigate your way through the Avalanche Bulletin, check out the next video in this series, Using the Weather Forecast. Yeah, Using the Weather Forecast. Give me one sec as I bring my other screen back in again. And there we go. The Mountain Weather Forecast. This is a really cool product. This is one that I'm really proud that we work in conjunction with the forecasters at Environment Canada to produce. Um, it's actually available all season long, and it's the place that I go to get my first crack at the weather, to kind of see what's going on for the day. It covers almost all the mountains of Western Canada from the coast to the interior, and even a bit into the Rockies, Yukon. 
and the North Rockies, of course. Um, so, you know, the forecaster funnel has, just means that we take the biggest, broadest view at the top, and then we distill it down to a, a valley or slope-specific weather forecast. And this does all the work for you. It's pretty cool. So it talks about, it gives you a brief overview. And then it tries to walk you through what's going to happen on individual days. Um, today, it's pretty interesting. We're getting snow and cold weather coming. It looks like it's going to be at minus 12 in Revelstoke over the next couple of nights. The cold weather, our first cold snap is on the way. And this just provides you with these great annotated images. And this is a product that previously would have to pay a lot of money as a professional organization to have. But now, in conjunction with Environment Canada, we have this out for backcountry users every day. So I know folks like things like spot weather, and I, I like those things too. But you can be led astray by those point forecasts. So it's really important to get the big picture. And then you can start to see, you know, does that point forecast from choosing your, your favorite weather model, does that, that match with what you were seeing in the big picture? So I think it's really important. Come to avalanche.ca, be pro, look at the weather, and then start to use your other favorite types of weather. There's some other cool tools here too, like hourly precipitation for forecast amounts. So you can kind of see where it's going to hammer, where the best place to go is if you want to go ride some deep snow. Um, we have radar too, so you can watch the storms come in from the various radar stations that are populated across Western Canada. And you can start getting to satellite imagery too. Satellites are in space. Pretty cool, eh? We have the Learn tab too, which Joe touched on there in his video. And we have all these really cool resources, including the brand new Avi Savvy page. This is a new page for folks that are new to the backcountry. Kind of get your feet wet. What is an avalanche? Where do avalanches happen? Um, we're really going to be encouraging folks to come visit this when they get a new, you know, if they're new to it with snowshoes. We saw a lot of the folks that were attending tonight um, have are pretty new to the backcountry, haven't taken an AST1 course yet. So this is the spot. Come here, move around, check out all our various resources, and then that can help to start preparing you for getting ready for your first AST course. Because an avalanche skills training course is something that we re that people need to have. We write all of our forecasts assuming that people have learned through a weekend course in AST1 they've learned all the various lexicon and how to interpret our products um, with some basic awareness. So it's really important to get an AST course if you're gonna be recreating in the back entry. Super important, can't say that enough. Learning things like conveyor shoveling, all that kind of good stuff. So the forecaster blogs, these are a, a fan favorite. Um, we do get a chance to, when we, things start getting tricky is when we usually start writing here and we're always trying to write more here because people really like to hear from kind of the, the forecasters. It's sort of a fireside chat. So pour a glass at Cognac and, or fine wine and sit down with us and really get into the nitty gritty of what's happening in the backcountry. Um, you can access these right on our website. And when we're doing these kind of things, you'll almost always see them on social media as well. So it, we always appreciate the shares. Uh, our users are so good about spreading this stuff around so we can all kind of learn about these tricky layers that they come to play in our snowpack. Tricky snowpacks and atmospheric rivers, it sounds like January, or in this case, December 19th. That's not very far away if you think about it. Could we be anything like that this winter? Who knows? But all sorts of neat stuff here. So the essential avalanche gear, a digital three antenna transceiver, an avalanche shovel, a dedicated and a dedicated probe. You know, sometimes we'll see folks with these short little probes, like the 240 centimeter probes. Most of the mountains of Western Canada are pretty deep snowpack, so make sure you have a 300 centimeter plus probe. And with all these things, early season checks are really important. Did you take the batteries out of your transceiver last spring? If you didn't, dig in there, have a look, make sure there's no corrosion because batteries have a tendency to split and uh, have some corrosion in them. So if that happens, you can you can send it back to the manufacturer. There's different ways to clean it, but Time to probably start popping the batteries back in there, making sure you have the latest firmware updates. These are really sophisticated pieces of equipment now. So if you've had your transceiver for a year or two, check the manufacturer's website, check it out, make sure that you've got the latest up operating system. And of course, it's been a long time since we've seen anything but these great aluminum shovels. I would really recommend having with an extendable handle so that you can get the most leverage on it. And then again, that 300 plus centimeter probe. And that probe, is uh, the way it connects a little ferrules and all those kind of things. You need to be inspecting that equipment. Make sure that there's no cracking in it. Make sure that, that the cord sheath or the little piece of cable still has the plastic on it. So as we're starting to get psyched about winter, making sure that you're checking out that equipment. This is the time to do that. Go dig it out of the closet, have a look at it. Now recommended gear, avalanche airbag packs. We get asked about them all the time. Uh, at work, I use one every day. And I actually ski and sled uh, for my personal days with one quite often as well. 
they've gotten so refined now with some of these new fan driven packs um the canisters are great too but you can kind of pick a backpack that works best for you they've gotten a lot lighter which makes me carry it a lot more than some of the some of the older packs um just a great tool to do, you know it's not it's not the magic bullet it's not going to magically help you escape from an avalanche but it is a great thing to have so it is a piece of recommended gear in reach now whether it's an in reach or some other kind of satellite communication device um they've gotten small they're super easy to use and i hardly go on a bike ride even by my, myself anymore without having one of these it's just so important that if you have a rack out there you require some additional help you have ability to get it now we know that if you have an avalanche accident you're the only one who's going to save yourself from that you and the party that you're with those are the folks who are going to help you conduct that avalanche rescue but if you're having injuries or need additional support, you're probably gonna to need to get out and you don't wanna be skiing or sledding back to cell phone range. You wanna have something to communicate with the outside world with. Also, it can just take the worry out of your uh, friends and family. So if you're gonna be an hour late, maybe you had a bit of an epic, decide to squeeze in one more lap or explore that back bowl and you're coming home a little bit late, you can let your loved ones know that um, you're okay and they should hold dinner for you if you're lucky. Radios. You know, sledders have been really good about carrying radios for a long time. And as professionals, we've always carried radios, but I'm always surprised by how few skiers have radios. Um, these are such a neat tool. You know, if, if you're skiing and your friend drops down, that you see him at the very bottom of the slope and you just kind of see him down there like doing this, ah, da, 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 waving their arms, like, I think I shouldn't go left. But if you have that radio, you just say, hey, what are, you, what are you talking about down there? Oh, I, I think you should just stay right because there's a rock outcropping, could be a thin spot trigger. It's like, oh, okay, that's clear as day. Um, sledding, you know, it's when you're boondocking, especially if you're maybe out of avalanche train playing in the trees and you're like, well, where's Jerry? And then you might say, like, things quiet down. You don't hear this engine anymore, but you can just reach out and say, like, Jerry, are you out there? Can you tell us where you're at? Radios are such an important tool, and I would really recommend that everyone carry one just to be more pro, you can talk with your buddies and you're not yelling out there, just that clear, concise communication that we know is so important in all aspects of life. The trip planner, this is a pretty cool tool as well. So on the left, you'll see something you may have seen in your AST course. And this is just, um, these are three different kinds of terrain that we go out there and rate. So professionals go out there into the mountains and the, along with digital mappers, or GIS folks, and we rate terrain as either simple, challenging, or complex. And then we have tools like the evaluator that help you take the, the latest avalanche forecast that you see on the right. And then it maps that area too. So you can see challenging train on this day, you know, with a moderate hazard, we're saying that normal caution is advised there. So you can't let your guard down, but it's a normal caution day. But if you start to push a little bit more, start to get into things that are a bit more complex or even starting to get into um, complex train as, you know, as this forecast evolves. So on Thursday, it's gonna be considerable. You can follow along here, considerable and complex, probably not recommended. So you can kind of float through the train here, have a good look at it, and that can help you to understand what train is a good idea today and what train maybe you should stay out of. So it can be a real nice point. Also, major avalanche paths interact with the normal travel routes are outlined in red. So yeah, really cool tool. And it, you'll be surprised by how many places are actually rated. Many of the more popular spots and even some that are not very popular have these eights ratings that can be so helpful. Mountain Information Network, we're not gonna dwell here too long because so we're gonna get into it a little bit more thoroughly in the next presentation, but blue dots are min reports, red dots are avalanche incidents. So we're gonna kind of leave it at that for now and we're gonna come back to that in the next presentation. So the app, you know what? The We've had various um, iterations of our app. If you have an old version, please make sure that you're jumping on the web store, whether it's the Google Play Store or the App Store and making sure you have the, the most recent version. It is working, it's working real well, it's slick. Um, if you ever have an issue, hit us up. We are an avalanche safety organization with a strong IT team, and we're always working to make these things that much better, but this thing's working pretty well, and I'd really encourage everyone to get it, so you can follow along on your phone, check those danger ratings, problems every day, refresh it before you hit the road, and you've got all that information right there at your fingertips. So that checklist is getting the gear, getting the training, and getting the app, and of course, getting home safe. So we're gonna take a few minutes here. We're gonna open the floor to folks who have raised their hands. Remember, you can click that little raise hand in uh, GoToMeeting. And we're gonna ask for some questions from the floor, then we'll go to the text channel as well. So 
I don't, I shouldn't have all the answers at my fingertips, but uh, we'll see what we can do here. Brent, do we have any questions from the floor? We currently don't have any hands raised. We had one up earlier. Um, they did put it down, but uh, I'm gleaning over at Nancy here, and I think they got a question coming out of the chat box there. So I'll leave it over to Nancy. Cool, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, hi Grant, a question from Jackie. Um, by carrying a radio, will it impact the transceiver's signal? Yeah, great question. So there, there is some evidence that when you're transmitting with a high power radio, um, you can have a little bit of interference with your transceiver. So you need to keep those things separate, of course. But your your radio is not like your cell phone. Um, you know, you can kind of control when and how you're talking with it. So there, you know, there's some minor interference, but that doesn't, it, it's a great reason to still have it. One thing you can do too is put the radio in the lid of your pack and then thread an external microphone so it sits on the shoulder strap of your pack, which is the how I set mine up. And then you've got that nice separation. You can't see it, but my other hand's down here on my belly from where your transceiver lives to that radio, good separation, and uh, that can be a, a great way to mitigate that. Any other questions from the chat there, Nance? Yeah, for sure. Um, from Jennifer, any details or recommendations for specs on what we're looking for with radios? <laughs> My radio point was well taken. Um, you can get some really turnkey radios from the folks at BCA. You can also go online and find the Amazon radio specials and oh, that's a whole other ball of wax I'm not gonna get into because you do need to have a license to operate a radio on any kind of private channels. So, but the FRS or family radio service, I believe it is, not a radio expert, but you can get all those kind of different products from various manufacturers. And I would just keep it simple. I think that the, the real important thing to have is a radio that has an external microphone, like I said, so you can kind of threat, keep the, the radio in your pack, have that microphone, because it's really bulky when you're sledding or, or ski touring to have it in a jacket pocket, for me personally. Um, but you can really delve into a black hole about radios there, so I won't I won't touch too much of that. You can also go down to your local radio shop, and with all the industry we have in, in British Columbia and Alberta, there's probably a radio shop around you. There's probably some experts who can really steer you into a nice radio. You can spend as kind of as little or as much money as you want on that one. Hey Grant, uh, another one from Logan. Should I put my transceiver in a bib pant pocket or keep it in the harness? Yeah, great question. You know, I think that there's a pretty clear answer and that that thing is an, it's an integral piece of safety equipment designed by a lot of really sharp people. And it was designed to go in the harness. Um, I know that it's vogue in some circles to have uh, transceivers in bib pockets, side pockets. I had a dear friend who was involved in a very large avalanche that actually tore um, the really nice side pocket, nice laminate, or it was a welded pocket, tore it right off of his uh, bibs and his transceiver went with it. Um, I think the best option is to have that transceiver in its dedicated uh, holster. That's how I've been running mine for 20 years. And it, it it's kind of it goes against your belly too. And that's a place that just your body has a tendency to protect. Um, keep it on the internal layers of clothing. It's often I put like a thin merino shirt on and then a little bit warmer layer, no matter if I'm sledding or ski touring or snowshoeing. And then that's where it goes. So any kind of, it often is shielded by my bibs and it's shielded by my external layers as well. And also it keeps that display, that little LCD display facing right against your, your organs. So it's soft. So I think that the way to do it is just to go with the manufacturer's recommendation, wear it in the harness, tweak it you know you can even go to a seamstress and have them move the straps around for you so that it's really in a nice place that's comfortable for you but our recommendation is to, to put that transceiver right in the harness it was made for hey thanks grant um i've got another question from debbie is the min a separate app from the avalanche canada app no good question it is it's, it, you can access it right on the Avalanche Canada app, so you can submit and view MINS or Mountain Information Network submissions. We're going to get into that in just a second here. And then you can also go to our website, avalanche.ca, and you can click on Submit, and you can go to a, a web-based uh, version of that, too, where you can also MIN. So you can do all that online or on the, uh, the mobile apps. But great question. Okay, and another one um, from Ashley. Last season, Avalanche Canada stopped reporting early due to COVID. Is there a risk that there will be no Avalanche Canada reports this year? 
You know, we really, I think, led the way along with some other big public safety organizations when we didn't know much about the virus. And we were all, it was a scary time. We were all washing our groceries, it seemed. Um, I really had to push backcountry skiing right out of my own head and watch. I mean, it was definitely good up there. I was riding my road bike as it was just hammering rain and snowing hard in the Alpine. It was hard on everybody. Um, at this time, we're taking it one day at a time, but with our with the current risk structure, we are producing avalanche forecasts. We intend to produce avalanche forecasts throughout the year. We're all carrying our mask around the office and we're, we know what we're getting into. We have a COVID protocols in place. Um, so the idea is to keep producing avalanche forecasts. I guess like anything in this world right now, where it's day to day, um, we'll, we'll, if something drastic were to happen, we'll make a new decision, but I, we're really geared up for what we expect to be a very busy year in the backcountry, and we intend to produce avalanche forecasts um, the whole season. So I think in these times, what we've all learned is that there's a lot of uncertainty, but for all intensive purposes, we're really geared up to produce avalanche forecasts the whole year. Thanks, Grant. Um, Rory has a question. What is the recommended lifespan for a transceiver? I've been using the same PEEPS DPS since 2011. Ooh, good question. And you know, they probably all differ. Um, first off, go to the manufacturer. The, there's a couple of things there. One, we, you, can, you can send your transceiver back, you can have it tested, and then if it's testing out a spec on either the send or receive antenna, you can actually send it back, usually for some factory calibration. So um, look into your, your transceiver and see if how you can get that thing tested. You might be able to just test it with a friend too. That's an important early season technique. Um, going through full functionality tests, and you can learn about those things on our website. I'm sure you can also go to the the Peeps website and play with that. So making sure that the range, um, both sending and receiving, is working. If you're having any issues, of course, it's time to stop using it. But I think, moreover, it's kind of like, it's almost like I, what I imagine someone that was a skydiver would do. They probably inspect that gear really, really carefully, and that's how we need to be treating our backcountry gear too. So really looking at all the different features of your transceiver, making sure there's no corrosion on the inside of it, making sure that there's no moisture on the inside of the screen. Um, you know the history of the thing too. If you've ever dropped it, that's probably a reason to send it back for a full factory test. Um, so kind of inspe the, the inspection component is really important, making sure there's no cracks anywhere. Um, do the self-test. And then if it's been since 2011 and it hasn't been back, I would go to your local retailer, ask them what they think about it. And you can figure out if it needs to get recalibrated or retire. Um, that's going to be up to each individual manufacturer to be a little bit different. But just treat that thing like a really important and critical piece of safety gear because your life does indeed depend on it. Hey, Grant. Looks like I got a question from the floor from Andrew Gustin. Andrew, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Andrew Gustin, you'd have to unmute yourself and uh, you can go ahead and ask your question to Grant there if you'd like. I'm going to give you a one. Oh, sorry about that. No. Ah, that's fine. Go ahead. Ask. Yeah, that's better. Uh, so I'm just looking actually on the on the map right now. And um, just a quick question. Avalanche data for Quebec, specifically the Shik Shocks, would be coming from Avalanche, Avalanche Quebec rather than the avalanche.ca site? Yeah, it'll be hosted on, you'll be able to see it on the avalanche.ca site, but it is all produced by our partners at AvQ. And so we don't write those forecasts here in the Revelstoke office. Those are written from our partners at AvQ in Quebec. Does that Thanks. answer your question? Yep. Thanks. Cheers. Probably got room for one or two more and then we'll jump into the next presentation and we'll have another question period after that too. Hey Grant, I've got one from Pablo. When you're planning a trip, how many days in advance are you paying attention to the bulletin? Oh, great question. So the Avalanche Bulletin is essentially a novel that starts right about now and finishes sometime in May or June as the snow melts. And like any novel, you really got to pay attention. You got to read every page to understand how it works. So what I would recommend is that you continue that you that daily, you incorporate reading the avalanche forecast. It only takes a few minutes to actually read a forecast. And that's going to give you the kind of the, the theme of the season so that you can understand as weak layers develop, you understand when the, when the more stable periods are, you understand when it's getting more dangerous. Um, so I would recommend reading the avalanche forecast actually every day. 
for, you, for the regions that you pay attention to and staying in touch with things like the forecaster blogs the social media we're, we're kind of we're kind of telling the narrative of the of the of the snowpack throughout the entire season but i can appreciate that not everybody lives close to the mountains and not everyone has a chance to to get into the mountains um every weekend so you know if you're going to be heading down on a trip maybe start looking a couple weeks out taking a look at the forecast so you can start to get a feel for what's happening and you know finally i think one thing that new folks will tend to do is to try and make plans to go to specific places a long time in advance so you might it might be wednesday night and you're having a, a dinner with your friend you're like okay where are we going to go on saturday and you start to line up places but that can actually be a bit dangerous because it might start committing you to places that by Saturday are gonna be quite dangerous. So my strategy with my friends is we always have a pickup time. We always you know, plan to be wheels rolling at about 6.30 or seven o'clock in the morning, but we'll usually have a kind of a menu of places that we're thinking about going. And then there's some early morning text or sometimes a, a call about, you know what, it's, it's hammered a lot. Let's just go to the ski hill for a little bit, feel it out. Or you know what, the conditions look pretty stable. I think it's time to get out and do something like the three pass traverse at Rogers Pass because it looks good to go. But I never commit myself to where I'm gonna go until really the day before. You know, picking your staging areas or, or no, like when you're in somewhere like Bale Mount, for instance, there's a whole bunch of different options of places you can go from pretty simple to pretty extreme. So I think it's really important to save the, the day of planning for the day of commit to getting out there, commit to meeting your buddies at a certain time, and then have that discussion with your group about what, about who's comfortable with what and where you can go for the day because everyone's, you know, with, everyone's risk threshold is actually quite different. So it's good to make sure you're all on the same page with that. Great question. How about one more and then we'll jump into the next presentation. Okay. Hey. Sorry, sorry about that, Grant. I was checking out so many questions coming in. Um, so there was a question from Kathy about K countries sending out their avalanche forecast daily, making it easy to read. And um, that can happen with any forecast. I believe they have to go to the RSS feed at the bottom of the bulletin. Yeah, you can set up your own RSS feed exactly, and you can set that up for whatever reader you want to uh, work with. Um, we don't email the forecast out anymore, um, but you can kind of, you can definitely set that up on your own if you want to receive it in your email. That's a great question. So we're going to wrap up questions for now. We're going to try not to keep everyone too late here, and I really want to touch on the min. So give me a second as we just switch over here. Just stand by one moment. Okay, and we'll do a quick switch over here. So give me a sec to get this set up. And we should be having our other screen up here in just a second. Cool, here we go. The min. The min is something that we were, you know, affectionately referred to as, well, the min, um, but it is the mountain information network. So as we start to think about talking about the min, I'm curious to hear hey, from all of you. Hey, I just want to interrupt you there, Grant. It looks like sure. the video is still up there. You just got Oh, thank you very much, Brent. That's yeah. Appreciate that. I had a uh, thanks, James. I just had a uh, quick bug that I had to fix as I closed my presentation during that vi that video. But now, with a little help from the rest of the village, we should have it back. Up You're and golden now. Thanks, buddy. So the MIN, Mountain Information Network. As we start to think of it and talk about the MIN, I'm, I'm curious to hear from all of our viewers out there 
who's used it? Have you, we're gonna throw a quick poll up. Have you never heard of the MIN? Have you been using MIN submissions from other people? Or perhaps you're one of those folks who's helping us submit. So you can go ahead and click on that. Let us know what you're seeing. You know, the, the MIN has had a tremendous amount of uptake and it's gonna be especially important this year. And I'll go into why that is in just a second here. Okay, so 50% of us have never heard of it, and 38%, but we'll call it 40%, have read some in reports, and 10% have submitted to the MIN. So this is going to be, a, this is a great and timely presentation. So we're going to really talk about the MIN and all of its details, and we're going to get into it here. So title of this one that we finally came on was Stop Stalking, Start Talking. But, you know, we actually, for a second there, we were thinking about some different ideas, like, oh, sorry, I'm just... You know, one of those ideas actually was, there we go, stop lurking, start working. Or maybe you prefer stop creeping, start speaking. We all know that there's all the different ways to use the media out there. So a few tongue in cheeks references there. But what it really is about is getting data into the hands of the forecasters and the users. So field teams, we've got field teams stationed throughout the mountains of Western Canada. These are a few images from our South Rockies field team. They're based out of Fernie, BC, and they do a tremendous job with Blizzard, Flathead, Elk Valley, all those kind of great places and the South Rockies, which are just beautiful places in the province. And we have the North Rockies team based out of Prince George and they cover a giant area that we know as the North Rockies. Um, just a tremendous team up there was new last year. It's been a lot of fun working with those folks and the North Rockies is near and dear to my heart. It's been a lot of time up there. And then we have the grandiose Yukon, based out of Whitehorse. Um, these folks are out there gathering data. So combined, these folks that are doing this up there, if you can believe it or not, we cover 12,000 square kilometers of uh, remote terrain in Canada, but Canada is a really big place and the mountains of Western Canada are huge. One of the coolest things about living here. So there's a lot of data sparse places that we're not able to cover with field teams. So what does data sparse mean? Well, for us to produce the forecast, um, this is actually a picture of me before I've had my morning coffee, and we actually are an office-based program here. So we have folks that are out in the field as guides. We're out going and doing our own field work. But when we come to produce forecasts, we do that right here from the, the, for, the forecast office here in Revelstoke. And so we're taking information that's collected across the province from professionals working in the field, so professional guiding operations, um, Ministry of Transportation operations, different industry operations like mining who are working in avalanche terrain, um, remote weather stations, all these kinds of different things feed into the big mosaic that is the forecasting pro program here in Revelstoke. So in data sparse areas, there's just not, we don't have those kind of tools. Maybe there's not highway teams, maybe there's not um, different guided operations. And places like the North Rockies, you know, it's huge. There's a lot of amazing train up there that there are just no professionals or regular guided groups going into at all. So we need to have field teams out there. Um, this gets more complicated this year too, because in these strange COVID times, we're anticipating there's gonna be a lot less professional observers out there working for the normal guiding companies. We're hoping that those folks can get back on their feet, get guiding safely as soon as they can, but the reality is that a lot of them are not gonna be doing that this winter. So the MIN has become even more important. So we have folks that go out there like yourselves, they can kind of be the weather stations. They can tell us what's happening out there. They can be gathering data. And you know this is obviously a very detailed min submission from one of our field teams, but that doesn't mean that that's not all that we need out there. It can be so much more simple. I'm gonna get into that in just a second. So this is the min. It's an open localized sharing platform designed for sharing current conditions. You can find it at avalanche.ca and it's designed to be used by both the public and professionals. So you don't have to be an expert to do this. Now this is a min submission. This is where you can get information. So this is a great min submission. This submission has the kind of avalanche conditions that these folks were experiencing. It has the kind of train they were staying away from and the things that they're getting into. It has some good photos and some comments. It's, it's a great submission. We're super psyched when we see stuff like this. Now this is how you give info on our website. So you can, you title it, you put all the relevant dates and all that kind of stuff in obviously. 
And then you can start to tell us about your day and what was good about it, what places you avoided, so we can kind of get into your mind and kind of feel out what you were feeling and seeing in the backcountry. So sharing is caring, and why is that? Well, we can see that from the folks that are watching tonight, only 10 or 12% have actually submitted to the MIN. And these regional forecasts, you have to understand, these are huge geographic areas. They cover diverse mountain weather environments, and the avalanche danger that we post is actually kind of the, the median for the, the region. There might be places that might actually be slightly higher danger. There might be places that are slightly lower danger, depending on the time of year and the, the danger rating. So min observations can really help to tune you in to drainage or local conditions. And that can help to you. It's an important piece of the safety puzzle that can really go a long ways into how are you going to behave out there and what's appropriate. So public and pros can help fill this in. So if you're a professional out there, we've got a few ITP or industry training program graduates out there, we want to hear from you here too. Um, this is a place that you can kind of strut your stuff as a professional, show people what's going on. Um, and you know, we all have a hand in making public avalanche forecasts the best they can be. And we really need you folks to be submitting to the MIN when you're out there. It can just be, it can be as quick and easy as you want it to be. It doesn't have to be super detailed. It doesn't have to take an hour to do this. It can just be something that you do quickly as you're having your debrief chips or soda or beer at the end of the day. So really looking at you out there. We're really trying to build a culture of sharing so we can all work together to make better backcountry decisions because things change really fast in the backcountry. And those kind of changes might be happening while we're in the middle of our day. You know, so when you get home from a day, especially early season, you might be there coming home from the day at three, putting a quick photo like this up that shows us like, hey, there's something going on here. The new storm snow is really reacting to um, the weight of a skier. That's something that's gonna impact our forecast and help make our forecast better. It may actually save lives. Or maybe you're seeing small skier or snowmobile triggered avalanches out there. We desperately wanna hear about these things. A picture tells a thousand words we all know well. So just can't, or can't uh, say enough that we really need the min post and we're we're really excited when we get them. And the uptake by the public has been tremendous, but this year we're putting an all points bulletin out there. Share with us, please. So incidents, um, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt once said that you get to learn from the mistakes of others because you can't live long enough to make them all yourself. And I think that's certainly true. I, I think Brent covered in my intro there that, you know, I feel like I make good decisions 99% of the time, but even some of those decisions that I felt were good led to bad outcomes. And some of those outcomes have been incidents throughout my career that I've, I've, I freely talk about. And we do the same thing at Avalanche Canada here. This is actually an incident that happened during one of our professional field days with our professional field team. But we're trying to be transparent. We're trying to walk the talk. And so we share about these things. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big heads up when someone has an incident. And if you're starting to see a professional have an incident out there, something, something is surprising them, well, then that's something to really pay attention to. But we wanna hear from you folks when you're surprised out there too. Um, and I think that as a community, you know, we are a backcountry community out there. There's no one, there's no winning in the backcountry, but there might be some minning. <laughs> Anyways, some barriers to posting to the min. Well, hopefully this season is a little bit better than the last season of Game of Thrones, and I think it probably will be, but there can be some technical issues. Over the years, the min has grown. We've been using new technology in terms of our apps and our, um, the page that we host on our website. So we know there have been some technical issues, but it really has gotten better. So, you know, we I saw in some Facebook comments over this week that there were some folks trying, still using the old, old, excuse me, the old app, which wasn't quite working well enough for them. So right now, take a look, make sure you have the most recent version of the app. Make sure you go to the app store, or the Google Play store, and make sure the most recent version will help you to have the best possible experience out there. Um, we're hoping this year too, that we're gonna be able to wrap let's say we're about 95% confident that we're gonna have it set up so you can actually edit your min submissions. We've heard that loud and clear from our users. And so hopefully that's coming. Um, if you wanna get into a more detailed of how to, how to actually submit to the min, you can go right to our website, that learn tab, and you can get some great videos about how to submit to the min and how to use the min in a little bit more detailed way. So what's in it for you? Well, a big part of it is that we can start creating this community. So you can be sharing with other users when you're seeing interesting things and, other, and with those other people are gonna be sharing interesting things with you. So this is the kind of thing that we're really hoping to, to get you guys and all of us to start participating in. 
but we just really want you to tell us what you're seeing and kind of reflect on your day too. Sometimes taking the time to put together a min with your party at the end of the day, you know, you might start to ask yourself some of those more professional questions like, did I get away with any, anything today? When was I most at risk? Um, what was the most important information I collected today? I think that debriefing your day is a really important time of getting better and making better decisions and let the min be a guide to that too. So you can kind of gather your crew, it's like, you know, who's gonna submit a min this evening? Okay, you know, I'll do it. Let's just take a few moments to talk about a few of these things. I think that can be a really neat process to help yourself get better as a back entry user. And what's in it for you? Well, there's swag in it for you too. We often do our min of the, well, we, every week we do our min of the week where we sit around as forecasters and the mins that really wow us. Um, we send those folks out with some cool Avalanche Canada swag, which is so good. And so we're trying to style people out when they're helping us out too and encouraging everyone to help out with this kind of thing. We hear from folks, you know, that they're not an avalanche expert and you don't need to be. Um, how much snow? What were the winds doing? Any recent avalanches? Snowpack structure if you want to get nerdy. But photos, 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 photos tell us so much. You know, a picture riding that you were up in the high alpine and it was still deep. So that snow, it tells me that there maybe there wasn't much of a slab that had formed up there yet. Or maybe your photo has... Uh, snow with or has trees with snow in them it tells me maybe the wind hasn't gotten into those trees yet so photos really tell a thousand words so you don't need to be an expert put in what you got and every little bit helps this is a big one that no one wants to give away their secret stash and so if you're heading into zipper mouth creek for the day and you don't want to geotag it we totally get it we're all passionate back entry users out there too and we like to get into the, the secret spots. So that's just fine. Sitting, putting the pin right where you were riding, just put it at the closest staging area or maybe the parking lot if you were touring. And if that's too telling for you, you can even put it in the closest town. Um, it's not about giving away your secret stash. You don't have to geotag like your line unless you really want to. Uh, but we just need to know generally where that information is coming from so that we can kind of get a good ballpark and, and figure out which area it applies to. So you don't have to give away your secret stash. Um, Another secret or another uh, barrier that we've seen is that folks really feel like they can get more reach on social media if they share it there rather than men, but they're not mutually exclusive. So submit to the men, grab that URL, drop it into your, your social media posts, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I don't know, are people TikToking men reports? Quite possibly. Um, so you can, you can bring that right over and then you can help people by directing them back to our website where they can start to look at the, the men submissions in an organized fashion. That would be killer. So yeah, definitely share it on your social media. That actually helps us a lot in getting the word out, but make sure you're posting it with us too. And then that way everyone has a chance to view it. This, this slide is really more about some of the things that are more specific happening down in the South Rockies, but the big one is just that AVCAN. If you can be hashtagging things with AVCAN, that helps us to get pinged and to see the information and make sure that we're getting it. You know, we can't possibly follow everyone or spend that much time on social media in a day to see everyone's post, but if you tag up AVCAM, hashtag AVCAM, chances are we're gonna see it. And social media is great. It's a great tool for us too. So we have our own accounts. The field teams have their own accounts. Um, we have the official AVCAM page and that's a great place to follow along with what we're doing. And you're gonna see the, the field teams posting a lot of their Ming content right to social media too. So, you know, I think that social media is just a great way for us to all share. So in summary, you can check out all of our products at avalanche.ca. You know, you can continually share your information through the men and the socials and you can promote a stronger and more informed backcountry community. And that's really what we're going after here. You know, I think we've all been rallying um, as a community. You know, we were all bummed to lose the, the tail end of the season last year. But let's just, we're out there as a, as a group. So please help by submitting to the men, using the men, talking about it. And that'll help us all to have a, uh, a great and fun season out there, which we're all starting to get pretty psyched for. So we've got a few minutes left. We're going to try and cap this at about an hour. But I'm going to reach out to Brent. Brent, do we have any questions from the floor there? We currently don't have any questions from the floor. No people want to speak up with the hands up which is just fine, I get that. But I'm pretty sure we got a few we can uh, take out of the questions chat box from Nancy. They're just streaming in on the chat box there. So I'll Great. give it over to Nancy. Go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, hey, uh, question from Logan and quite a few people. They're curious what Avalanche Canada's stance is on the PEEPS controversy and the current situation um, with safety issues. Yeah, good question. I think some of these issues are just coming to light. 
And we're certainly aware of what's happening out there. We know that there are some incidents where people feel like their transceivers switched inappropriately in a pocket or otherwise. Um, we've asked Black Diamond and Peeps to look into this a bit more. And we're just asking people, of course, to be, you know, all these avalanche transceivers have to come into a quite rigorous testing and they must meet uh, a pretty high bar to be known as an avalanche transceiver. So we know Black Diamond's looking into it. Um, I, I'm not an engineer. We're not engineers here. We're not quite sure what it, what the issues are, or how widespread those issues are. But I think what it really comes down to is a couple of things. One, know your gear, um, inspect it very closely, and make sure that you're following along with the manufacturer's recommendations. If you have any question about your gear, I, I honestly feel like it's like a, the old climbing rope adage. If there's any question, there's no question. So get in touch with the manufacturer, see what you can do about that and make sure you've given, that you just feel confident in your gear. Um, I'm not sure how this is all gonna play out in terms of peeps and all those kind of things, but it, they have been making great gear for a long time and hopefully they'll figure out and get to the bottom of whatever it is happening out there. So yeah, we'll go with, we'll go with that. Great, thanks Grant. And um, quite a few people, there's some ice climbers out there. They're curious about the min and what sort of information should they be submitting and what would be useful? Yeah, great question. Well, actually, this year we're going to start differentiating um, some of the dots on the map for ice climbers because I realize they are a little bit different. Um, I think that one of those things that might be worth talking about is, I mean, all the things that you're paying attention to as a climber. So, um, what was the ice condition like? Was there snow sloughing down the climb? Has has an avalanche run down the climb? You know, as we know that many of those uh, many ice climbs are avalanche paths as well. So did you did you show up at the climb and see that there was debris there? Um, is there a hanging snow field above it? Kind of all those things that you're taking into consideration as you're assessing the risk on the climb, I think would be great to share on the min. And we're gonna get into some ice climbing specific webinar evenings too. And we're continually evolving here at Avalanche Canada to service all of the backcountry users, including ice climbers, that much better. So if you think there's specific information that you would like to see in ice climbing men, please reach out. We're working through some of those things and we're, we're, we roll out software and pretty iterative and pretty frequent changes to make things better. So ice climbers looking at a group that we're looking at servicing that much better as we move through time. Um, I think those are some great things that you can start thinking about and submitting to the Mint. I think Nancy is scanning there. Yeah, for some more. I am. Actually, I just I just responded. There was a question about um, somebody writing in and saying, "Hey, we want to go out, but in the winter, but we don't have um, we don't have we want to do some hiking and snowshoeing. We haven't had any training or." bought any avalanche safety equipment. So I was encouraging them to go to our fresh start, start here page at avalanche.ca and, and learn something and avoid avalanche terrain until they get the training and the gear. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we all have to kind of take it one bite at a time out there and we got to get that, you really have to have that gear. There's just no going into the back country without it. And then you have to get the training so you can recognize avalanche terrain and avoid it because otherwise everything kind of looks like avalanche terrain. So, yeah, getting the gear and getting the training will help you to get out there and have a great time. Great, you wanna take one more? Sure. <laughs> um, question is, is there a how to read the forecast page or guide? Yeah, you can go to our YouTube or Vimeo channel and you can see that video that I showed earlier, um, which can help walk you through that. And then, you know, things like Avi Savvy, the learning page, start playing with our website, you're gonna come up with a lot of different resources um, about how to, to best read the forecast and how to tease different information out of it. I think a big part of it too is just making sure that you're getting into that second tab for the avalanche details, the snowpack summaries, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's all there. So play with those tools at avalanche.ca and that can help walk you through that some more. So maybe with that, we'll let the chat go for a little bit here, but I'm gonna hand it over to our producer, Brent, to wrap us up for the evening. Thank you guys so much for sitting down with me this evening. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. We're gonna be doing more of these. And I'll let Brent take it away to wrap it up here. Excellent. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, good job for Grant. I can hear the hand clapping going mad for you. 
Um, yeah, good first session here, folks. Thank you all for joining us. We do appreciate your interest in avalanche safety. Um, you can support essential programs like this by donating to Avalanche Canada with as little as $10. We're going to put a link into the chat box where you can go and donate to Avalanche Canada. Um, our next webinar is going to be next Wednesday again, same time, 7 p.m. And we're going to talk about the Renshaw tra tragedy, which is uh, a snowmobile incident that happened up in northern British Columbia. And uh, it will be a case study on that incident. Um, Pre-registration is required. And we hope to get you folks coming out again. Uh, I'd really like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we're gonna wrap it up here with uh, our little Stoke video and uh, we hope you folks have a great winter.